Today is your new beginning. Today is a land of beginning again. This morning, I will give to you an invitation which is an opportunity to step into the circle of life. And my guest today is Juanita Booker. She'll be singing, singing the song that won for her the invitation to sing for the president's inauguration. It's an exciting and glorious day here in Garden Grove, California. Thousands of people are arriving to experience an hour of power with Robert Schuller from the Crystal Cathedral. We invite you to join us for a Christian celebration in possibility thinking. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hear the creation story which we find in the first chapter of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. Then God said, let the waters below the heaven be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also, and there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Then God said, 
Let the waters teem with swarms of living creature, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. And God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Look at me, look at you. What is this old world coming to? There's so much that needs to change. But it's me and it's you. We have so many things to do that we don't even feel the pain. And all the time, We say God is very much alive. Your prayer, my prayer, it has to be. God use you, yes, and God use me. Reaching out and touching lives, but when at last we're through, oh, our God, we'll owe it all to you. Look at them, look at us, why all the need, why all the fuss, how complicated life can be. Look at them, look at him, does he say, child, your light is dim and we don't even hear him speak. And all the time. very much alive. Your prayer, my prayer, it has to be. God use you, yes, and God use me. Reaching out and touching lives, but when at last we're through, God, we'll owe it all to you. My guest today is a very inspiring young man, Warren Duffy. And I'm not going to say anything more than that. I'm going to say, Warren, come on up and let's talk. God loves you and so do I. Good morning, Bob. Warren Duffy, uh, how do we tell your story? Where were you, uh, let's say, 5, 10, 12 years ago? Well, a few years ago, I was beginning a career in broadcasting in my hometown in Baltimore. And very quickly, being a precocious child, having finished two years of college by 17, by the time I was 21, I was um, program director of a major market radio station. By the time I was 25, I was recognized as one of the top 10 programming executives of broadcast facilities in America. And about that same time, I was one of the top 10 radio personalities in the country. Uh, pioneered a lot in AM and then in FM radio, and ultimately opened a public relations firm and handled the international public relations for a great many entertainment people. Like who? Oh, well, I promoted concerts for everyone. Well, I can go back a little bit further than even promoting concerts. I was one of the first radio personalities in America to play the Beatles on the radio back in about 1963 when they were big in England but had not yet become very famous internationally. That was sort of a, a landmark, as you can imagine. 
And then um, I dealt with the Rolling Stones and uh, the Who and the Beach Boys and Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix and rather a long list of pretty famous rock and roll people. But Janis Joplin is dead. Jim Morrison, uh, uh, the lead singer for The Doors, is dead. Jimi Hendrix is dead. Um, John Lennon is dead. Uh, one, of the, one of the entertainers from the Rolling Stones is dead. Many of the people that I dealt with, and we were all young people. We were 30 and 35 years in private jets and limousines, and the world was our oyster. And they were dead, and many of them were dead from drugs. And this was my path also. Um, probably during my life, um, with my ponytail and my... You, your hair was in a ponytail? My hair was in a little ponytail. You would have loved it. I can't it. believe it. <laughs> I, I have to tell you a funny thing. This is the first tie that I have had on in 15 years. <laughs> when Christ comes into your life, he can make some marvelous changes. Although it doesn't say in the Bible, you know, you shall be born again and you shall therefore wear a tie. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, um, I, I imagine that during my life, I probably did 300 LSD trips. I consider myself a very fortunate man just to be standing here. Uh, then what happened? You hit sort of the bottom, I suppose, or you went downhill. When I opened my business, Bob, I, in the first 90 days that I had my shingle out, I put $145,000 in the bank. Times were really good, private jets, phones in the car. And drugs really took the bottom out of my life, and I wound up penniless and broke. And I was living in Northern California, and being a Sunday morning football fan, I went to the only television set that was on the entire Big Sur coastline in Northern California. And I turned the set on to watch my football games. And here was this very subtle, cherubic-faced person who says, this is the day that God has... Who is this? And I listened to what he had to say, and for some strange reason, and I've heard many of your pulpit guests describe the same sensation, I began to cry. Well, I wasn't going to have any of that. I turned you off. <laughs> Went back into the woods until the football game came on. And the same thing happened maybe two or three times until finally I decided that I was going to come down here and visit your congregation and see what this was all about in person. My wife, in the meantime, had found the Lord. And our whole family was praying for me. And when I came down here on April the 27th of just this year... That's, that's uh, 1980, right? 1980. Last year. When you weren't even here. Yeah, seven months ago. Right. Dr. Beckering was here, yes. and he delivered the sermon, and he said, if there's anyone out there who would like to turn their life over to Christ today, please come up here, and he would be standing at the door of the old church. And so I went up to him after that service, and I said to him, today is the day I'm turning my life over to Christ. And Bob, it has literally... God has taken his chisel and worked on my life, and I'm just so grateful to you and to this ministry. It's beautiful. Thank you very much, Warren Duffy. Wait a minute, tell me, how has God guided you since that day, which is seven months ago? I mean, you, you, you've really been challenged just to live the challenging Christian life, haven't you? Well, <laughs> you think you're really living when you don't have Christ and you have a lot of material things in the world. But when Christ comes into your life, it is an entirely new living experience. A lot of the old things drift away. Many of your friends always oh, he's a Jesus freak now. They disappear. Many of the things that you held, many of the books that were on your bookshelf, they no longer apply and they disappear. Suddenly the Lord has opened up many wonderful areas for service. I live out in the Palm Springs area. We're right now beginning to apply to the FCC to establish a Christian radio station that will broadcast nothing but Christian entertainment throughout that entire valley. So there are many wonderful opportunities that God is guiding me toward. I'm very grateful to you. Uh, Warren, tell me, uh, isn't it true that once you were into Buddhism and Hinduism for a time and... Uh, Those were some of the books on the shelf, yes. Is that right? I remember spending a good deal of my life sitting on a cushion and taking this wonderful mind that God had given me that got me out of two years of college by the age of 17 and sitting on the cushion and learning how to think of nothing. 
for two or three hours at a day. <laughs> and learning how to do it really well. <laughs> With a ponytail. <laughs> With a ponytail. <laughs> and no tie. And no tie. You were telling me and your wife uh, uh, an interesting s story about how God has blessed you in tithing, how you were challenged one Sunday. Share that with these good people. <laughs> we had just figured out our budget, and life has changed by virtue of both decimal points and zeros in our annual income. So we're earning a good deal less, and the budget is, I'm sure for everyone in America today, it's a little bit tighter than it was a few years ago. So we had just worked our monthly meeting, our, our monthly budget out with our little family business meeting, and it was very tight. And once again, we went to the television set and turned it on on Sunday morning, and here he was back again. This is the, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the message that Sunday was on tithing. Well, we had no idea of how we were going to do it, but after the service was over, we turned, turned you off and we looked at each other, my wife and I, and you know, God did not say you should begin tithing when it's convenient or you should begin tithing when you get your next raise. He said you must tithe. And so we decided that we were going to, at that date, write our check and we were going to give 25, I must confess at that time it was 25% or 10% of the net. We have since become 10% of the grocers. But at that time, we wrote our check and we took it off on Monday morning and we mailed it to you to support this, in, uh, this ministry. And God has his own marvelous accounting system and I can really attest to it from my own experience. We wrote that check off not knowing how we were going to make ends meet that month. And that very month, God delivered to our family a complete house of new furniture. That was the first week. A complete house of new furniture. It was just a gift from a Christian woman who no longer had use for it. And you didn't have any furniture. Not at that time. Life had really gotten tough. Yeah. And then two weeks later, we were living in a small studio apartment. And two weeks later, the Lord gave us a beautiful two-bedroom house for the same amount of rental money, complete with a swimming pool in the front yard. <laughs> Warren Duffy, you've been a Christian now since April of 1980, April 27. Yes. God loves you, so do I. Keep growing and keep glowing. Thank you very much. God bless Thank you. you. Thank you very much. You know, there's one thing that's unique about our national television ministry. We specialize in what we call possibility thinking. It's the only national and international television ministry, including broadcasting every Sunday on the Armed Forces Network. It's the only program internationally that focuses on positive thinking week after week after week after week, and it's thrilling 
how God has used this ministry. The other day I was performing the uh, prayer breakfast message at the uh, United States Military Academy in West Point. And a member of the football team came up to me and he said, Dr. Schuler, I want you to know how the Hour of Power and your written ministry has really helped me. And he showed me a book that he'd put together. It, was, it says the Army Football 1979. And here he has all of the records and all of the inspirational goals that the teammates can choose. And when you open it up in the middle, he has a quotation from Omar Bradley and over here, Dr. Robert Schuler. I tell this to you because somebody listening to me did this for this young cadet and the Army football team at West Point. And here on the back page, a quotation from General Douglas MacArthur, Earl Blake, Earl Blake, Robert Schuler, Earl Blake, Robert Schuler, Earl Blake, Robert Schuler, uh, Corner Nelson, Earl Blake, Robert Schuler, Robert Schuler, Robert Schuler, Douglas MacArthur, and on the back page, Robert Schuler. I was absolutely dumbfounded. This ministry is the only ministry that specializes in telling you that all things are possible if you really believe. Now, we've taken four of my most popular and helpful books, hardcover books, all on possibility thinking, and we have put them in a beautiful simulated leather jacket. And I'd like to mail this as a gift to you. The entire collection is called How You Can Arrive, Survive, and Thrive Through Possibility Thinking. The books are Peace of Mind Through Possibility Thinking, The Peak to Peak Principle, Reach Out for a New Life. Some time ago, I was at a Hollywood gathering with some of my friends in that industry, and Cary Grant came up to me and said, Dr. Schuler, I have your book on my bedside table. I said, which one? He said, it's the Positive Prayers for Powerful Living. This entire collection I want to send to you. Will you help me, and can I help you? You know, this ministry has been widely publicized in the United States of America in national magazines like Time Magazine, Newsweek, and others as being the ministry that receives the lowest amount of dollar income of all of the nationally known ministries, even though it has, according to Arbitron and Nielsen, the largest rating and the largest viewing audience of any weekly television program. Nobody does more for less than we do. And that's because my salary is paid for by this church, by this congregation. It costs the television ministry nothing. Not a single dollar ever mailed to this ministry helps me or comes to me personally. The entire choir is made up of volunteer persons who are members of this church. This crystal cathedral was paid for by people who wanted to build it. The money does not and did not come from the offerings of people who wrote to our power. Special gifts built this building. So we don't have to rent a studio and we don't have to pay for the quote talent, end quote. That's all free, which is a reason why we can be the least expensive of all the national television ministries. And yet, having said that, in the face of rising costs of inflation, airtime, we suffered a loss of 100,000 in October, 160,000 in November. Our bills just met the income in December. January was good. Not a good enough to, to take care of the loss of October, November, but March and April, we're hoping and believing that the Committee for Survival will be God's way to save this ministry for the United States of America. I'm so grateful that Mr. Glenn Ford has agreed to serve as chairman, and I'm so grateful that many of you listening to me now will say, this ministry must not terminate. If we can find 10,000 people in the United States who will, in this calendar year, make a special gift of $500, we know we will not only arrive, but we will survive and thrive. And that will not only keep this ministry alive, but hopefully there will not be a city in the United States where this television program cannot be seen every Sunday. When I was a young man, I used to watch the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen 
when I was going through college and going to theological seminary, and I listened to him because my undergraduate degree was in psychology, my graduate work was in theology, and the Archbishop Fulton Sheen was the only religious television personality on national television who had a psychological and a theological training and was syncretizing the two in a way that met my intellectual, my emotional, and my theological needs. The sad thing is, I just assumed every week he would be there. And I never wrote him a letter. I never told him how this ministry helped him. I was a Protestant. Why should I support a Catholic? That was my mistake. Today, this ministry would not survive <laughs> if it were not for the support of our Catholic and Jewish and non-Christian friends. But years later, when Archbishop Fulton Sheen went off television never to return because he lacked the financial support to keep it going, years later, I would establish this television ministry. And I tried to pay my debt to the Archbishop and invited him to come, that leading Roman Catholic preacher. And I stepped aside and turned this Protestant pulpit over to him. And he preached four glorious messages from this pulpit which were televised to the world. And then he died. But not before we had a chance to say, thank you. I owe you a lot. If you want to say thank you to this ministry, will you pray about this? Become a member of the Committee for Survival. Write to me today. Address your letter to Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. In the corner, you may say, Attention, Glenn Ford. And tell me you'll be a, com a member of the Committee of Survival, either making a gift of $500 now or over a period of a few months. And immediately, I'll mail to you a collector's edition, a, li a living library that will be a source of pride and pleasure and inspirational strength to you. I need your help. Without it, 1981 will be the end of our television ministry. All we need are 10,000 people. 10,000 people who will say, if I don't do it, nobody else will either. Will you write to me today? Be one of the 10,000. Simply write to Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California, and God will bless you. And we'll keep putting fire of possibility thinking in the lives of the young people and the old all through the year. God loves you. I say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jeannie Schuler, and I've stepped out of the service a moment to welcome you to the Krista Cathedral. It's your support that makes it possible for us to broadcast this beautiful service weekly to your home. So we want to thank you today for sending your contribution to Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. It's Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. Today, my father has made an appeal for 10,000 of his friends to join the Committee for Survival. But we know that there are many of you out there who could help us in so many smaller ways. For your support is desperately needed, but deeply appreciated. Today, in gratitude, my father wants to send you a medallion that he has worn around his neck for 10 years since he began this television ministry. It's called the Good Shepherd Medallion, for it has the picture of the Good Shepherd statue, but it also holds the Possibility Thinker's Creed. And the creed states, when faced with a mountain, I will not quit. I will keep on striving until I climb over, tunnel underneath, find a pass through, or simply stay and turn the mountain into a gold mine with God's help. Let us help you turn your mountains into a gold mine. Write today and ask for your Good Shepherd medallion. Simply send your letter and request to Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. That's Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. In Canada, write Robert Schuler, Box 3, 4212, Postal Station D, Vancouver, British Columbia. 
and in Australia, the address is Robert Schuller, GPO Box 557, Sydney, New South Wales. In a few moments, my father will share his morning message, and later we'll tell you how you can receive a printed copy of his words. For right now, let's return to this exciting service. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of my Lord. He is trapping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath is stored. He has loosed that faithful lightning of a terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. With the glory in his bosom that transfigured you and me. For he died to make men holy. Let us die to make men free. His truth. Is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory. We'll bring Juanita Booker back on another Sunday because she knows the truth. And the truth that goes marching on, what is it? It is the truth that you can be what God wants you to be. My text this morning is a very favorite special Bible verse. It's been an enormous source of joy to me. It's from Canticles chapter 2, verse 12. Canticles in the Bible is also called the Song of Solomon. Take your choice. The Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 12. A very appropriate Bible verse for us at the threshold of a nice, new, gleaming year. These are the words. 
and the time of the singing of the birds has come. There is no more beautiful time of the day than when the birds sing. There is no more beautiful season of the year than when the birds <laughs> sing. The time of the singing of the birds has come. And what does that mean? When is that time? I want to answer that question this morning. The time of the singing of the birds, it is in the morning time. Of course. When the darkness of the night is past and the blackness is gone, almost before the first rays of sun, even as the east becomes pink, the birds break out in their melody. What does it mean? Why? The time of the singing of the birds, it's the time when you are given a new chance, a new opportunity, a time to begin again. It's the beginning of a new day. Every new day is a chance to start life over once more. Every new day is a January one. That's exciting. The time of the singing of the birds is the time when God gives us a chance to start all over fresh and clean. It's the time when the dream is born. The brilliant idea comes into your mind. When the concept arises, that's the time of the singing of the birds. A way to understand a truth is always to look at its opposite. I said once when I was lecturing to a bunch of college professors, I put it in more sophisticated language, I said a truth is always affirmed in a dialectic situation which is a way of saying, I understand what health is when I lose it. I understand what daylight is when I'm in the darkness and the lights go out. I understand what joy is when I don't have it. Integrity is always affirmed in a dialectic situation. In other words, you want to know what the singing of the birds means? It's, the, it's just consider the opposite. When you have no dreams, when you have no goals, when you have no burning desires, when you have a yawning, whole hum attitude toward today, that's the absence of the singing of the birds. The time of the singing of the birds, why, it's, it's the morning of your life. It's the beginning of the day when the brilliant dream bright idea. You know, I have a friend in the real estate business and once in a while he finds a, a product to list a house or a piece of property and he calls it a sleeper. And I said, what do you call it a sleeper for? He said, because it's loaded with possibilities. The price is so low. It's a super bargain and nobody notices it. That's a sleeper. Great possibilities that nobody is noticing and the price is really a bargain. There's no way you can buy it and not turn it around and make a pile of money. That's a sleeper. Every sleeper is loaded with possibilities waiting to be discovered. Are you a sleeper? Why? Probably you're a sleeper because you think, I can't really make it. I mean, the, I, I don't think I've got what it takes. The truth is you do. Did you, one of my elders, this past week, Dr. David Messenger told me the story. He said there are a whole group of life insurance people having a conference, a convention in a big hotel downtown. And the president said, the truth is, many of you people aren't selling enough because you're not trying. You think, well, it won't work. I can't do it. People aren't going to buy from me. There are, these are bad times, and people are holding on to their cash, and uh, there's no sense in going out. He said, the truth is, you could sell if you only tried. And he gave this assignment to all of the salesmen. He said, we're going to take a break. And in the next 
next 60 minutes, I'm going to have you all go through this whole tower. And he sent them to the tower across the street, a 35-story tower filled with business offices in downtown L.A. He said, I'm going to have you go through all this tower. You're going to get off the elevator, and he lined them up. A, B would get on those whose names started with A and B would get off on one floor, B and C on another floor, etc. And so they were to cover the tower. He said, you will go to the front desk, the first person you meet, and you will ask them the most negative thinking question you can possibly conceive. You'll go to the desk and say, these are tough times, and I'm sure you don't want to buy insurance, do you? So he did. They took the break. All of the salesmen went through that tower, that office tower, and they asked the negative question, these are terrible times. I'm sure you don't want to buy any insurance, do you? And what do you suppose happened? They didn't sell any insurance. Wrong. They still sold insurance in spite of that negative attitude. That means if a negative thinker like that can succeed, what do you think you can do with a positive attitude when you try? You can, no doubt about it. Years and years ago, we had nothing, no property, no members, no money. Now we've got property and no money. <laughs> and we've got members, we don't have the money, you know, really don't. And you know, I learned one lesson. Ask and you shall see. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open to you. The choir sang it today. If you try, you will succeed. Now, many people are sleepers because they think they can't do it. Other people are sleepers. They're not doers. They're not achievers. They're sleepers because they think they won't make any difference. The world doesn't need me. Who cares? Nobody appreciates me. You know, I was born and raised on an Iowa farm. I think many of you probably know that. And they tell the story back in Iowa. My father was a very devout man, a very, very devout Christian. And once the preacher came to call, and he came and called, and he looked at the straight, clean rows of corn. Beautiful. And he looked at the waving acres of grain, beautiful. And he said to my father, he said, well, uh, Mr. Schuler, look at the corn, look at the wheat, look at the land. Isn't it beautiful what God does with this property? And my father nodded his head, but he said, yeah, but you should have seen it when the Lord had it all by himself. God needs you and he needs me to do his work today. In a world where so many people need help, there's no excuse for you or me or anybody saying, I can't make a difference. The birds start singing when you're given a challenge, an invitation, an opportunity to help. Somebody said to me, Dr. Schumer, don't you feel awful when you ask people for money like you do th today on television? And I say, not at all, because I'm giving people the greatest gift they can get because everybody needs to be needed. And it's God putting meaning in your life by taking your gift and making this beautiful thing happen. That's true. When do the birds sing? The birds start singing when you are given a call, an idea, a dream, a challenge in the morning. Now, my second point. Here's the second point. When is the time of the singing of the birds? It's not just in the morning. It's in the noontime, too. Yes. When hope is restored in the dark time of life. Some of you are in the noontime, not in the morning. 
I mean, you're in a project and you don't know if it's going to succeed. I know what that's like. I remember the time when the cathedral was going up and the steel was rising and we had the foggiest idea where we would get the money to complete it. And I know what the dark times are. Then a bird sings. The middle of the day, under the heat of the sun, sitting in the shade, there a single solitary warble coming from the deep throat of a feathered creature above you in the tree. It's the way God works. He knows when we need our enthusiasm restored. Should I quit? Maybe I should fold up, pull away. I have to tell you, I'm speaking a little from a personal testimony here because of the challenge of inflation and recession. I spent 48 hours up until December 25 of 1980 with one prayer in mind, God, should we retire from a television ministry? Because there's no way we can continue without asking for more help. I don't want to do that. It was a noontime, and I came. I'm telling you something very private. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe this is too private, but I always tell you something. Christmas Eve, December 24, I came to this platform, and this crystal cathedral was packed with people, and they were standing, and they left at 5 o'clock. And a second service, and it was packed, and people were standing, and they left at 6.30. And at 8 o'clock, they came, and it was packed, and people were standing, and they left. And at 9.30, they came, and it was packed, and they left. And at 11 o'clock, it was packed, and they left. And somebody handed me a copy of Time magazine with a picture of this church. And somebody else, uh, Newsweek, and one of the great accomplishments of 1980 was the Crystal Cathedral. We had 18,086 persons here. And I went home, and I was depressed. Like you never saw me, because I wouldn't show my face in that kind of a mood. I was depressed because I gave myself an F for my message. My sermon, I gave myself a flunk. I think I know how to prepare messages. I think I could be a great professor of preaching at a theological seminary. And I did not give myself a passing mark, and I don't care how big the crowds were. I don't care how many people came. I don't care what kind of national publicity there is. If I'm not satisfied with what I did for God, Nothing satisfies me. And I made up a mind. I wasn't going to lay the trip on my family. Christmas morning, all the kids came home. I was a happy family. I mean, my daughter was there with her six-month-old boy, born last year. The time of the singing of the birds has come. For Sheila, it was when she had her baby boy. My son was there, Bob with his wife, Linda, and their little daughter. The time of the singing of the birds came for my son last year when he was ordained into the ministry. Time of the singing of the birds has come, and our family was together. Carol was there, unable to wear her artificial leg because she'd injured her stump in a skiing accident, but she was high and happy. We were a happy family, and I was smiling, but I stepped out of the house and went for a walk in the garden alone. And then I heard the words. I don't want to get emotional here because this is very meaningful to me. I heard the words in my mind, and I knew the message came from him. The words were, I will reward you for what you did for me last night. And I said to him, no, Jesus, no. I do not deserve it. I did an awful job. And he said, but you told people about me. 
you were not ashamed to tell them that I was alive. And for that, I will reward you. And I must tell you, alone in my garden, I wept with joy because I knew that from a human standpoint, I had failed. But in his eyes, I had found favor. The time of the singing of the birds has come. Sometimes in the morning, sometimes at the noon time. And you, you think, will I never heal? Will the cast never come off? The time will come. The birds will sing. The cast comes off. You walk out of the hospital. Remission is set in. You get your checkup. No cancer anymore. A miracle. Sometimes they sing in the morning, <laughs> sometimes at noonday. And you know what? The time of the singing of the birds, this is my third point, also in the setting of the day and the sunset time. Then they come out in a resplendent chorus. <laughs> my prayer has long been, Lord, help me to live, that when I come to the end of my life, there may be pride behind me love around me and hope ahead of me. The time of the singing of the birds is the time when the dream is born and you set a new goal for yourself, for your God. The time of the singing of the birds, it's noontime. When you think you're failing and maybe you should retire or quit, and God comes to sing again and give you new hope and to tell you that you can survive and thrive if you'll depend on him. The time is the singing of the birds. It's when the dream is born. It's when the dream is revived in the heat of the noon. It is in the setting sun when the dream has totally come true and you get your degree, you walk out of the hospital, you're arm in arm again, marriage has been restored. It's the singing of the birds and the cathedral is finished. The support comes. Listen, when do the birds start singing? In the morning? Yes. In the noontime? Yes. In the setting of the sun? Yes. And the honor is bestowed. But you know how it all starts? Sometime waken very early, and the birds do not singing, start singing in chorus. There is always one solitary note. Suddenly there comes a time when one single bird starts to sing, and he wakens a sleeper. And two birds are singing, and they waken the sleepers, and three, and then four, until there is a chorus of music. And that's the way it happens with you. One idea will come into your mind, and I give you that idea now. Listen, this idea is the single note that can start a chorus a bird singing in you, the single idea, the solitary note, the awakening music that I give you now is one sentence from Jesus Christ. Come unto me. Come unto me. Let us pray. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you are alive and that you invite us to become your personal friends and that you want to use us, our voice, our hand, our prayers, our gifts, to change the world and fill it with a melody of hope. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Christ, to Thee. This is my New Year's commitment. Now, amen. So
you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may God grant unto you his peace in your going out and in your coming in, in your lying down and in your rising up, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears until you come to stand before Jesus in that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen. Thank you for sharing with us in an exciting morning here at the Crystal Cathedral. Your support makes it possible for us to broadcast this unique worship service to your home. And we believe that this ministry is a special inspiration to you. Dr. Schuler's message is available in a printed form so that you can receive the same uplift throughout the week. Or you can share your faith in this ministry by sending the booklet on to a friend or loved one. Write today for your copy of Dr. Schuler's message. Address your letter to Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. That's Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. Despite tremendous financial challenges, this ministry will survive. For Dr. Schuler has announced a special campaign to enlist several of his friends to the Committee for Survival. But this group cannot do it alone. Dr. Schuler needs the continued support of his faithful friends to meet our annual production costs. Your involvement in this ministry is key. You are needed as never before. Here at the Crystal Cathedral, we live by the belief that when faced by a mountain, we will not quit. This strong statement is part of Dr. Schuler's Possibility Thinker's Creed. As we face a mountain now, we believe that, with your support, we will not have to quit. These words have been inscribed into a precious medallion, which we call the Good Shepherd Medallion. On one side of the coin, the statue of the Good Shepherd is delicately engraved. The other side bears the famous Possibility Thinker's Creed. Together, the Shepherd and the Creed give a strong base for our faith. Dr. Schuler wants to send you one of these treasured medallions for your help in climbing our mountain. Your support, great or small, will mean our continued success. Write Dr. Schuler today. He needs your prayers and encouragement. Simply send your letters and gifts to Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. That's Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. In Canada, write Robert Schuler, Box 34212, Postal Station D, Vancouver, British Columbia. In Australia, the address is Robert Schuler, GPO Box 557, Sydney, New South Wales. If you feel like the mountains in your life are too big to scale, we want to help you. You can find encouragement and support at our telephone counseling service. Simply dial area code 714 in the letters N-E-W-H-O-P-E. That's area code 714 in the words New Hope. And now for Dr. Schuler and all of us here at the Crystal Cathedral, this is Ed Arnold. God loves you and so do we.